We're fortunate, ladies and gentlemen, to have really a breath of fresh air seemingly fall from outer space onto the political scene because never before has our country been in greater need of true leadership and really some old-fashioned common sense. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Barack Obama. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me begin by thanking Lester uh, for his outstanding leadership on so many issues uh, in Chicago and around the country uh, and his wonderful friendship uh, towards me. Uh, I am extraordinarily grateful to him. Uh, let me thank you, uh, the Council, for helping to organize this. We originally were set to deliver this last week, and as a consequence of the tragedy at Virginia Tech, we had to reschedule. So for those of you who were planning to come last week, thank you for coming back. Uh, and uh, obviously, all of us are still mourning uh, what happened and uh, still trying to uh, absorb uh, the enormity of the tragedy there. But uh, I very much appreciate all of you taking the time, and uh, I hope that none of you were inconvenienced uh, by our needing to reschedule last week. You know, uh, we all know that these are not the best of times for America's reputation in the world. We know what the war in Iraq has cost us in lives and treasure, in influence and respect. We've seen the consequences of a foreign policy based on flawed ideology and a belief that tough talk can replace real strength and vision. Many around the world are disappointed with our actions. And many in our own country have come to doubt either the wisdom or the capacity to shape events beyond our borders. Some have even suggested that America's time has passed. But while we know what we have lost as a consequence of this tragic war, I also know what I've found in my travels over the past two years. In an old building in Ukraine, I saw test tubes filled with anthrax and the plague lying virtually unlocked and unguarded. Dangers, we were told, could only be secured with America's help. On a trip to the Middle East, I met Israelis and Palestinians who told me that peace remains a distant hope without the promise of American leadership. At a camp along the border of Chad and Darfur, refugees begged for America to step in and help stop the genocide that has taken their mothers and fathers, their sons and their daughters. And along the crowded streets in Kenya, I met throngs of children who asked if they'd ever get the chance to visit that magical place called America. So I reject the notion that American moment has passed. I dismiss the cynics who say that this century cannot be another when, in the words of President Franklin Roosevelt, we lead the world in battling immediate evils and promoting the ultimate good. I still believe that America is the last best hope on Earth. We just have to show the world why this is so. This President may occupy the White House, but for the last six years, the position of leader of the free world has remained open. And it is time to fill that role once more. I believe that the single most important job of any president is to protect the American people. And I'm equally convinced that doing that job effectively in the 21st century will require a new vision of American leadership and a new conception of our national security a vision that draws from the lessons of the past but is not bound by outdated thinking. In today's globalized world, the security of the American people is inextricably linked to the security of all people. When narco-trafficking and corruption threaten democracy in Latin America, it's America's problem, too. When poor villagers in Indonesia have no choice but to send chickens to market infected with avian flu. 
it cannot be seen as a distant concern. When religious schools in Pakistan teach hatred to young children, our children are threatened in the process. Whether it's global terrorism or pandemic disease, dramatic climate change or the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the threats we face at the dawn of the 21st century can no longer be contained by borders and boundaries. The horrific attacks on that clear September day awakened us to that new reality. And after 9-11, millions around the world were ready to stand with us. They were willing to rally to our cause because it was their cause, too, because they knew that if America led the world toward a new era of global co cooperation, it would advance the security of people in our nation and all nations. We know how badly this administration squandered that opportunity. In 2002, I stated my opposition to the war in Iraq, not only because it was an unnecessary diversion from the struggle against the terrorists who attacked us on September 11th, but also because it was based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the threats that 9-11 brought to light. I believe then, and I believe now, that it was based on old ideologies and outdated strategies, a determination to fight a 21st century struggle with a 20th century mindset. There is no doubt that the mistakes of the past six years have made our current task more difficult. World opinion has turned against us. And after all the lives lost and the billions of dollars spent, many Americans may find it tempting to turn inward and cede our claim of leadership in world affairs. I insist, however, that such an abandonment of our leadership is a mistake that we must not make. America cannot meet the threats of this century alone, but the world cannot meet them without America. We must neither retreat from the world nor try to bully it into submission. We must lead the world by deed and by example. We must lead by building a 21st century military to ensure the security of our people and advance the security of all people. We must lead by marshalling a global effort to stop the spread of the world's most dangerous weapons. We must lead by building and strengthening the partnerships and alliances necessary to meet our common challenges and defeat our common threats. And America must lead by reaching out to all those living disconnected lives of despair in the world's forgotten corners. Because while there will always be those who succumb to hate and strap bombs to their bodies, there are millions more who want to take another path, who want our beacon of hope to shine its light their way. This election offers the chance to turn the page and open a new chapter in American leadership. The disappointment that so many around the world feel toward America right now is only a testament to the high expectations they hold for us. We must meet those expectations again, not because being respected is an end in itself, but because the security of America and the wider world demands it. This is going to require a new spirit, not a bluster and bombast, but of quiet confidence and sober intelligence, a spirit of care and renewed competence. It will also require a new leader. And as a candidate for President of the United States, I'm asking you to entrust me with that responsibility. There are five ways, five ways America will begin to lead again when I'm President. Five ways to let the world know that we are committed to our common security, invested in our common humanity, and still a beacon of freedom and justice for the world. The first way America will lead is by bringing a responsible end to this war in Iraq and refocusing on the critical challenges in the broader region. In a speech here in Chicago five months ago, I argued there can be no military solution to what has become a political conflict between Sunni and Shia factions. And I laid out a plan that I still believe offers the best chance of pressuring these warring factions toward a political settlement a phased withdrawal of American forces with the goal of removing all combat brigades from Iraq by March 31st, 
of 2008. I acknowledged at the time that there are risks involved in such approach. That's why my plan provides for an over-the-horizon force that could prevent chaos in the wider region and allows for a limited number of troops to remain in Iraq to fight al-Qaeda and other terrorists. But my plan also makes clear that continued U.S. commitments to Iraq depend on the Iraqi government meeting a series of well-defined benchmarks necessary to reach a political settlement. Thus far, the Iraqi government has made very little progress in meeting any of the benchmarks, in part because our President has refused time and again to tell the Iraqi government that we will not be there forever. The President's escalation of U.S. forces may bring a temporary reduction in the violence in Baghdad at the price of increased U.S. casualties, though the experience so far is hardly encouraging. But it cannot change the political dynamic in Iraq. A phased withdrawal can. Moreover, until we change our approach in Iraq, it will be difficult to refocus our efforts on the challenges in the wider region, on the conflict in the Middle East, where Hamas and Hezbollah feel emboldened and Israel's prospects for a secure peace seem uncertain. On Iran, which has been strengthening itself as a consequence of the war in Iraq. And on Afghanistan, where more American forces are needed to battle al-Qaeda, track down Osama bin Laden, and stop that country from backsliding toward instability. Burdened by Iraq, our lackluster diplomatic efforts leave a huge void. Our interests are best served when people and governments from Jerusalem and Amman to Damascus and Tehran understand that America will stand with our friends, work hard to build a peaceful Middle East, and refuse to cede the future of the region to those who seek perpetual conflict and instability. Such diplomacy cannot be done on the cheap, nor can it be warped by an ongoing occupation of Iraq. Instead, it will require patient, sustained effort and the personal commitment of the President of the United States. That is a commitment I intend to make. The second way America will lead again is by building the first truly 21st century military and showing wisdom in how we deploy it. We must maintain the strongest, best equipped military in the world in order to defeat and deter conventional threats. But while sustaining our technological edge will always be central to our national security, the ability to put boots on the ground will be critical in eliminating shadowy terrorist networks we now face. That's why our country's greatest military asset is the men and women who wear the uniform of the United States. This administration's This administration's first Secretary of Defense proudly acknowledged that he had inherited the greatest fighting force in the nation's history. Six years later, he handed over a force that has been stretched to the breaking point, understaffed, and struggling to repair its equipment. Two-thirds of the Army is now rated not ready for combat. Eighty-eight percent of the National Guard is not ready to deploy overseas. And many units cannot respond to a domestic emergency. Our men and women in uniform are performing heroically around the world in some of the most difficult conditions imaginable. But the war in Afghanistan and the ill-advised invasion of Iraq have clearly demonstrated the consequences of underestimating the number of troops required to fight two wars and defend our homeland. Now, that's why I strongly support the expansion of our ground forces by adding 65,000 soldiers to the Army and 27,000 Marines. But adding troops isn't just about meeting a quota. It's about recruiting the best and brightest to service. And it's about keeping them in service by providing them with first-rate equipment, armor, training, and incentives they deserve. It's about providing funding to enable the National Guard to achieve an adequate state of readiness again. And it's about honoring our veterans by giving them the respect and dignity they deserve and the care and benefits they have earned.
A 21st century military will also require us to invest in our men and women's ability to succeed in today's complicated conflicts. We know that on the streets of Baghdad, a little bit of Arabic can actually provide security to our soldiers. Yet just a year ago, less than 1% of the American military could speak a language such as Arabic, Mandarin, Hindi, Urdu, or Korean. Less than 1%. It's time we recognize these as critical skills for our military, and it's time we recruit and train for them. Former Secretary Rumsfeld said, and I quote, you go to war with the army you have, not the one you want. I say that if the need arises when I'm president, the army we have will be the army we need. Of course, how we use our army matters just as much as how they are prepared. No president should ever hesitate to use force unilaterally if necessary to protect ourselves and our vital interests when we're attacked or imminently threatened. But when we use force in situations other than self-defense, we should make every effort to garner the clear support and participation of others. The kind of burden-sharing and support President George Herbert Walker Bush mustered before he launched Operation Desert Storm. And when we do send our men and women into harm's way, we must also clearly define the mission, prescribe concrete political and military objectives, seek out advice of our military commanders, evaluate the intelligence, plan accordingly, and ensure that our troops have the resources, support, and equipment they need to protect themselves and fulfill their mission. We have to take these steps with the knowledge that while sometimes necessary, force is the costliest weapon in the arsenal of American power in terms of lives and in terms of treasure. And it's far from the only measure of our strength. In order to advance our national security and our common security, we have to call on the full arsenal of American power and ingenuity. To constrain rogue nations, we have to use effective diplomacy and muscular alliances. To penetrate tenorous, terrorist networks, we need nimble intelligence communities with strong leadership that force agencies to share information and invest in the tools, technology, and perhaps most importantly, human intelligence that can get the job done. To maintain our influence in the world, we need to get our fiscal house in order. And to weaken the hand of hostile dictators, we have to free ourselves from our oil addiction. None of these expressions of power can supplant the need for a strong military. Instead, they complement our military and help ensure that the use of force is not our sole available option. The third way America must lead again is by marshalling the global effort to meet a threat that rises above all others in urgency, securing, destroying, and stopping the spread of weapons of mass destruction. As leaders, from Henry Kissinger to George Shultz, to Bill Perry, to Sam Nunn, have all warned the actions we are taking today on this issue are simply not adequate to the danger. There are about 50 tons of highly enriched uranium, some of it poorly secured at civilian nuclear facilities in over 40 countries around the world. In the former Soviet Union, there are still about 15,000 to 16,000 nuclear weapons and stockpiles of uranium and plutonium capable of making another 40,000 weapons scattered across 11 time zones. And people have already been caught trying to smuggle nuclear materials to sell them on the black market. Here's the thing. We can do something about this. As President, I will lead a global effort to secure all nuclear weapons and materials at vulnerable sites within four years, the most effective way to prevent terrorists from acquiring a bomb. We know, we know that Russia is neither our enemy nor our close ally right now. And we shouldn't shy away from pushing for more democracy, transparency, and accountability in that country. But we also know that we can and must 
work with Russia to make sure every one of its nuclear weapons and every cache of nuclear material is secured. And we should fully implement the law I passed with Senator Dick Lugar that would help the United States and our allies detect and stop the smuggling of weapons of mass destruction throughout the world. While we work to secure existing stockpiles of nuclear material, we should also negotiate a verifiable global ban on the production of new nuclear weapon material. As starting points, the world must prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons and work to eliminate North Korea's nuclear weapons program. If, if America does not lead, these two nations could trigger regional arms races that could accelerate nuclear proliferation on a global scale and create dangerous nuclear flashpoints. In pursuit of this goal, we must never take the military option off the table. But our first line of offense here must be sustained, direct, and aggressive diplomacy. For North Korea, that means ensuring the full implementation of the recent agreement. For Iran, it means getting the UN Security Council, Europe, and the Gulf states to join with us in ratcheting up the economic pressure. We must also dissuade other countries from joining the nuclear club. Just the other day, it was reported that nearly a dozen countries in and around the Middle East, including Syria and Saudi Arabia, are interested in pursuing nuclear weapons. Countries should not be able to build a weapons program under the auspices of developing peaceful nuclear power. That's why we should create an international fuel bank to back up commercial fuel supplies so that there's an assured supply and no more excuses for nations like Iran to build their own enrichment plants. It's, it's encouraging that the Nuclear Threat Initiative, backed by Warren Buffett, has already offered funding for this fuel bank, if matched two to one. But on an issue of this importance, the United States should not leave the solution to private philanthropists. It should be a central component of our national security. And that is why we should provide $50 million to get this fuel bank started and urge other nations, starting with Russia, to join us. Finally, if we want the world to de-emphasize the role of nuclear weapons, the United States and Russia must lead by example. President Bush once said, and I quote, the United States should remove as many weapons as possible from high alert hair trigger status, another unnecessary vestige of Cold War confrontation. Six years later, President Bush has not acted on this promise. I will. We can and should not accept. We can and should not accept the threat of accidental or unauthorized nuclear launches. We can maintain a strong nuclear deterrent to protect our security without rushing to produce a new generation of warheads. Now, the danger of nuclear proliferation reminds us of how critical global cooperation will be in the 21st century. And that's why the fourth way America must lead is to rebuild and construct the alliances and partnerships necessary to meet common challenges and confront common threats. In the wake of the Second World War, it was America that largely built a system of international institutions that carried us through the Cold War. Leaders like Harry Truman and George Marshall knew that instead of constraining our power, these institutions magnified it. Today, it's become fashionable to disparage the United Nations, the World Bank, and other international organizations. In fact, reform of these bodies is urgently needed if they're to keep pace with the fast-moving threats that we face. Such real reform will not come, however, by dismissing the value of these institutions or by bullying other countries to ratify changes that we drafted in isolation. Real reform will come because we convince others that they, too, have a stake in change, that such reforms will make their world, and not just ours, more secure. Our alliances will also require constant management and revision if they're to remain effective and relevant. For example, over the last 15 years, NATO has made tremendous strides in transforming from a Cold War security structure to a dynamic partnership for peace. Today, NATO's challenge in Afghanistan has become a test case 
in the words of Dick Lugar, of whether the alliance can overcome the growing discrepancy between NATO's expanding missions and its lagging capabilities. We have to close this gap, rallying members to contribute troops to collective security operations, urging them to invest more in reconstruction and stabilization, streamlining decision-making processes, and giving commanders in the field more flexibility. And we should strengthen NATO at the same time as we should also seek to build new alliances and relationships in other regions important to our interests in the 21st century. In Asia, for example, the emergence of an economically vibrant, more politically active China offers new opportunities for prosperity and cooperation, but it also poses new challenges for the United States and our partners in the region. It's time for the United States to take a more active role here, to build on our strong bilateral relations and informal arrangements, like the six-party talks. As President, I intend to forge a more effective regional framework in Asia that will promote stability, prosperity, and help us confront common transnational threats, such as tracking down terrorists and responding to global health problems like avian flu. In this way, the security alliances and relationships we build in the 21st century will serve a broader purpose than preventing the invasion of one country by another. They can help us meet the challenges that the world can only confront together, like the unprecedented threat of global climate change. Now, this crisis of climate change is one that cannot be contained to one corner of the globe. Studies show that with each degree of warming, rice yields, the world's most significant crop, fall by 10 percent. By 2050, famine could displace more than 250 million people worldwide. That means people competing for food and water in the next 50 years in the very places that have known horrific violence in the last 50, in Africa, in the Middle East, and in South Asia. As the world's largest producer of greenhouse gases, America has the greatest responsibility to lead here. We must enact a cap-and-trade system that will dramatically reduce our carbon emissions. And we must finally free ourselves from our dependence on foreign oil by raising our fuel standards and harnessing the power of biofuels. Such, <laughs> such steps are not just environmental priorities. They are critical to our security. America must take decisive action in order to more plausibly demand the same effort from others. We should push for binding and enforceable commitments to reduce emissions by the nations which pollute the most, the United States, the European Union, Russia, China, and India. Together, those four countries account for nearly two-thirds of our current emissions. And we should help ensure that growth in developing countries is fueled by low-carbon energy the market for which could grow to $500 billion by 2050 and spur the next wave of American entrepreneurship. The fifth way America will lead again is to invest in our common humanity, to ensure that those who live in fear and want today can live with dignity and opportunity tomorrow. In recent reports, we saw that al-Qaeda's progress in recruiting a new generation of leaders to replace the old ones we have captured and killed, that these new recruits come from a broader range of countries than the old leadership, from Afghanistan to Chechnya, from Britain to Germany, from Algeria to Pakistan. Most of these recruits are in their early 30s. They operate freely in the disaffected communities and disconnected corners of our interconnected world, the impoverished, weak and ungoverned states that have become the most fertile breeding grounds for transnational threats like terror and pandemic disease and the smuggling of deadly weapons. Some of these terrorist recruits may have always been destined to take the path they did, accepting a tragically warped view of their religion in which God rewards the killing of innocents. But millions of young men and women have not. Last summer, I visited the Horn of Africa's Combined Joint Task Force, 
which was headquartered at Camp Lemonier in Djibouti. It's a U.S. base that was set up four years ago originally as a place to launch counterterrorism operations. But recently, a major focus of the task force has been working with our diplomats and aid workers on operations to win hearts and minds. While I was there, I also took a helicopter ride with Admiral Hunt, the commander of the task force, to Diri Dawa, where the U.S. was helping provide food and water to Ethiopians who had been devastated by flooding. One of the Navy captains who helps run the base recently told a reporter, quote, our mission is at least 95 percent civil affairs. It's trying to get at the root causes of why people want to take on the U.S. The Admiral now in charge of the task force suggested that if they can provide dignity and opportunity to the people in that region, then the chances of extremism being welcomed greatly, if not completely, diminishes. And we have heard much over the last six years about how America's larger purpose in the world is to promote the spread of freedom, that it is the yearning of all who live in the shadow of tyranny and despair. I agree. But this yearning is not satisfied by simply deposing a dictator and setting up a ballot box. The true desire of all mankind is not only to live free lives, but lives marked by dignity and opportunity, by security and simple justice. Delivering on these universal aspirations requires basic sustenance, food and clean water, medicine and shelter. It also requires a society that is supported by the pillars of a sustainable democracy, a strong legislature, an independent judiciary, the rule of law, a vibrant civil society, a free press, and an honest police force. It requires building the capacities of the world's weakest states and providing them what they need to reduce poverty, build healthy and educated communities, develop markets, and generate wealth. And it requires states that have the capacity to fight terrorism, halt proliferation of deadly weapons, and build the health infrastructure needed to prevent and treat such deadly diseases as HIV, AIDS, and malaria. As President, I will double our annual investments in meeting these challenges to $50 billion by 2012. And ensure and ensure that those new resources are directed towards these strategic goals. For the last 20 years, U.S. foreign aid funding has done little more than keep pace with inflation. Doubling our foreign assistance spending by 2012 will help meet the challenge laid out by Tony Blair at the 2005 G8 conference, and it will help push the rest of the developing world to invest in security and opportunity. As we've seen recently, with large increases in funding for our AIDS programs, we have the capacity to make sure this funding makes a real difference. Part of this new funding will also establish a $2 billion global education fund that calls on the world to join together in eliminating the global education deficit, similar to what the 9-11 Commission proposed. Because we cannot hope to shape a world where opportunity outweighs danger unless we ensure that every child everywhere is taught to build and not to destroy. I know that many Americans are skeptical about the value of foreign aid today. But as the U.S. military made clear during my visit at Camp Lemonier, a relatively small investment in these fragile states up front can be one of the most effective ways to prevent the terror and strife that is far more costly, both in lives and treasure, to the United States down the road. In this way, $50 billion a year in foreign aid, which is less than one-half of 1% 1 of our GDP, doesn't sound as costly when you consider that last year the Pentagon spent nearly double that amount in Iraq alone. Finally, while America can help others build more secure societies, we must never forget that only the citizens of these nations can sustain them. The corruption I heard while visiting parts of Africa has been around for decades. But the hunger to eliminate such corruption on the part of the population there is a growing and powerful force. And so in these places where fear and want still thrive, 
we must couple our aid with an insistent call for reform. We must do so not in the spirit of a patron, but the spirit of a partner, a partner that is mindful of its own imperfections. Extending an outreached hand to these states must ultimately be more than just a matter of expedience or even charity. It must be about recognizing the inherent equality and worth of all people. And it's about showing the world that America stands for something, that we can still lead. These are the ways we will answer the challenges that arrived on our shores that September morning more than five years ago. A 21st century military to stay on the offense from Djibouti to Kandahar. Global efforts to keep the world's deadliest weapons out of the world's most dangerous hands. Stronger alliances to share information, pool resources, and break up terrorist networks that operate in more than 80 countries. And a stronger push to defeat the terrorist message of hate with an agenda for hope around the world. It's time we had a president who can do this again, who can speak directly to the world and send a message to all those men and women beyond our shores who long for lives of dignity and security, a message that says, you matter to us. Your future is our future, and our moment is now. It's time as well for a president who can build a consensus at home for this ambitious but necessary course. For in the end, no foreign policy can succeed unless the American people understand it and feel a stake in its success and unless they trust that their government hears their more immediate concerns as well. After all, we will not be able to increase foreign aid if we fail to invest in security and opportunity for our own people. We can't negotiate trade agreements to help spur development in poor countries so long as we provide no meaningful help to working Americans burdened by the dislocations of a global economy. We can't expect Americans to support placing our men and women in harm's way if we cannot prove that we will use force wisely and judiciously. But if the next president can restore the American people's trust, if they know that he or she is acting with their best interests at heart, with prudence and wisdom and some measure of humility, then I believe the American people will be ready to see America lead again. They will be ready to show the world that we are not a country that ships prisoners in the dead of night to be tortured in far-off countries, that we are not a country that runs prisons which lock people away without ever telling them why they are there or why they are char what they are charged with, that we are not <laughs> that we are not a country which preaches compassion and justice to others while we allow bodies to float down the streets of a major American city. That is not who we are. America is the country that helped liberate a continent from the march of a madman. We are the country that told the brave people of a divided city that we were Berliners too. We sent generations of young people to serve as ambassadors for peace in countries all over the world. And we're the country that rushed aid throughout Asia for the victims of devastating tsunamis. Now it's our moment to lead, our generation's time to tell another great American story. So someday we can tell our children that this was the time when we helped forge peace in the Middle East, that this was the time. that this was the time when we confronted climate change and secured the weapons that could destroy the human race, that this was the time when we brought opportunity to those forgotten corners of the world, and this was the time when we renewed the America that has led generations of weary travelers from all over the world to find opportunity and liberty and hope on our doorstep. Many of you know one of those travelers was my father. I barely knew him, but when, after his death, I finally took my first trip to his tiny village in Kenya and asked my grandmother if there was anything left from him. She opened a trunk 
and took out a stack of letters, which he handed to me. There were more than 30 of them, all handwritten by my father, all addressed to colleges and universities across America, all filled with the hope of a young man who dreamed of more for his life. It's because somebody in this country answered that prayer that I stand before you today with faith in our future, confidence in our story, and a determination to do my part in writing our country's great next chapter. The American moment has not passed. The American moment is here. And like generations before us, we will seize that moment and begin the world anew. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.